Hi everyone, it's me again. Um, so I was told after I had finished my presentation that actually I was cut off after about 10 minutes, which I didn't realise. So I'm really sorry about that. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what happened. I think I lost connection on my end. So I'm going to re-record it for you now. I'll go through the opening 10 minutes a bit faster because you've all listened to that already. And uh, hopefully we can get this to you um, before the weekend. So you can you can study up on serverless and PHP. So as you know, my name is Ben. I'm a senior developer advocate for AWS Serverless. And prior to joining AWS, I was a PHP developer for something like 15 years. And um, I'm a big fan of serverless technologies. And this presentation is all about the benefits of serverless, why I think it's a great uh, sort of technology paradigm for you to build in, and why it's come a long way for PHP developers to be able to build with serverless technologies now. So I've already said the word serverless quite a lot uh, in the opening slide, and I think I should probably define exactly what I mean by serverless. So there's a few tenants that we often talk about at AWS when we are discussing serverless. Um, and the first is that there should be no infrastructure to provision or manage. So that means no servers to spin up, nothing to operate or patch, no physical or container orchestration of any sort. The next is that there should be automatic scaling. So it should scale by unit of consumption rather than by unit of server or unit of compute. There should be a pay for value billing model. So that means when you're not using the service, you're not getting billed for it. And there should be availability and fault tolerance baked into the service. So when we say serverless, really what we're talking about is the removal of server operations. So that's the important distinction for developers and for our customers, because it allows you to focus on building your application rather than spending time on the infrastructure that that application sits on. Which brings me to some of the traditional challenges with PHP applications. So when I first started building with serverless technologies, it was because I was again and again hitting these common challenges of scalability and synchronization. And this is a kind of high level uh, simplified, simplified version of a LAMP stack implementation. So I have here a load balancer, which uh, routes uh, requests from the internet to different servers based on whatever algorithm that I've given that load balancer. And if I need to scale up to add additional capacity to my, um, my application, I have to scale horizontally like this. So every time I need more capacity, I have to add a whole new server, a whole new node to my load balancer. And each server that I add brings additional overhead in the form of networking, administration, storage capacity, backup and resource systems, I might also have to update some kind of asset management inventory. And because each server also has its own disk and its own file system, it runs independently from the other. So you, you will often come up against synchronization issues. So using serverless technologies, this, this uh, challenge of scalability is completely taken away from you. It's managed for you. So if there's a surge in traffic, the service is scaled to meet demand without having to deploy additional servers. So what this means is it allows you to transition really quickly from prototype to production. Once your application is built and it's secure and it works, it's ready to handle all the traffic that it that it um, is thrown at it. And I kept saying that now is a good time for PHP developers to take another look at serverless, specifically now. And in order to understand why I say that, it's useful to have a look at the kind of timeline of events that have led up to today. So in reInvent of 2014, uh, Lambda was first launched and Lambda is this compute service that lets you run code in response to events and it automatically manages the compute resources for you in order to do that. Then in July of 2015 um, was a service that was launched called Amazon API Gateway and this enabled developers to build secure scalable APIs really quickly in front of a variety of different type of architectures. Then at the following re-event of um, November 2017, we announced a new configuration for relational database resources that allows you to pay on a second by second basis. So bring in the payment model more towards a serverless uh, way of paying. Then in November of 2018 was a really significant launch of two different things, two different features for Lambda, which was Lambda Layers and the custom runtime API for Lambda. And the Lambda Layers allows you to share 
um, common code between Lambda functions and the custom runtime API allows you to bring your uh, custom runtime of any language that can run in a Linux compatible environment into Lambda. Then in September of 2019, uh, we improved the VPC networking for Lambda. So that means those Lambda functions that have to operate inside a VPC, customers were telling us that they were experiencing performance issues. So by utilizing a uh, more efficient use of the Elastic Network interface, we were able to solve that issue. And that's important because in order for your Lambda function to communicate with a relational database, both of those have to be configured to run inside the same VPC. Then in November of 2019, Amazon RDS Proxy was launched, which is this highly available database proxy for RDS databases. And this makes applications much more scalable and more resilient to database failures when building with relational databases. So this, once again, is the serverless LAMP stack. Lambda, API Gateway, MySQL, and PHP. So uh, Linux is replaced with Lambda, and Apache is replaced with API Gateway. And I'm going to step into each one of these services uh, in a little bit. So first is Lambda. So Lambda sits at the center of a few industry trends and terms. You might have heard of event-driven compute, functions as a service, or serverless FAS. And Lambda could reasonably be described as all three of these things and, and, and more. It's a product that uh, allows you to run code without provisioning or managing any servers. So you pay only for the compute time that you consume, and there's no charge at all when your code is not running. And there's some interesting parts of uh, sort of a Lambda anatomy that you need to first understand when building with Lambda. So the first is something called the Lambda function handler. And this is the starting point of your Lambda function. It's the first function that is uh, running when your Lambda function is invoked. And in, uh, provided to that handler are two objects. There's the event object and the context object. And the event object uh, is the first argument to the handler function. And this contains information about the event in a JSON format. So for example, if your event was invoked by uh, HTTP API, that event object will contain information about that invocation event. So it will have the body of the HTTP API request. It will have the header of the request and so on. The next argument is the context object. And this contains information about the invocation itself, which provides methods that allow you to interact back with the runtime and the execution environment. And then you'll notice in this example, I have on the left the PHP example, on the right the Node.js example. Both of them have a handler function, and both of them have the event and the context object passed into it. And on both, again, above the function are the function's dependencies. And these are configuration options or helper functions. And this is where you might initialize database connections, for example, or some sort of static initialization. Another way of thinking of the anatomy of a Lambda function is like this, as a kind of onion with various layers going from the outermost layer in. So first, there's the Lambda compute substrate. This is the underlying compute for all of Lambda. Next, there's the Lambda service itself, which manages the scheduling and the organization of workloads across hundreds of thousands of customers. And both of these layers are completely invisible to the customer and managed entirely by AWS. Then the next step in, there's the execution environment. So this is the customer specific and AWS account specific layer. And this is the secure space where your code uh, is run. Then inside each execution environment, there's the language runtime. And finally, there's your function, which is the code that you provide zipped up as a package with any dependencies that are required. So next is API Gateway. And API gateways, you often hear it said, are the kind of front door to your backend services. And with Amazon API Gateway, you have this fully managed service that makes it really easy to create and maintain and secure APIs at virtually almost any scale. These APIs can be used to access data or business logic uh, or functionality from your backend services. And you can create RESTful APIs or WebSocket APIs for real-time two-way communication or a newer configuration called HTTP APIs. And all of these can be used for containerized uh, applications or serverless applications, as well as any form of web application, really. So Amazon API Gateway is a, a really comprehensive service, which um, is often discussed in great detail in events like reInvent. But 
some key features I like to pull out are that it's perfect for communicating with microservices. It has built in protection from DDoS attacks and throttling for your back end. And you can configure to authenticate an authorized request to a back end in a number of different ways. So then there's MySQL and that's MySQL running on Amazon Aurora with Amazon RDS proxy. So Aurora is our cloud native database and it's still the fastest growing service in AWS history. With Aurora, a database instance is created inside a virtual private cloud, a VPC, uh, and this prevents public access to that database instance. And then in order to connect to the Aurora database instance from a Lambda function, that Lambda function must also be configured to access the same VPC. And it provides high performance and availability for MySQL and PostgreSQL databases with the underlying storage scaling automatically to meet demand of up to 64 terabytes, which is about 70,000 gigabytes. And you can use that in conjunction with the service called Amazon RDS proxy, which is a database proxy that lets you pull and share database connections for improved application scaling. So before RDS proxy, a common problem that our customers would often report to us was that they would be suffering from database memory exhaustion when they had hundreds or thousands of Lambda functions opening and closing connections to the database at a really high rate. And this surge in database connections uh, would often lead to slower queries and limited application scalability. So RDS proxy was built specifically to solve that problem. It establishes a database connection pool, and that pool sits between your application and the, related, the relational database, and it reuses connection in this pool. So that protects your database from oversubscription without memory and CPU overhead of opening and closing a new connection each time you need to connect. The credentials for the database are securely stored in AWS Secrets Manager, and then they're accessed by a, an identity access management role. So this forces really strong authentication requirements for those applications without this costly migration effort for the database instance itself. And in order to connect to Amazon Aurora from a Lambda function using RDS proxy, there's a token exchange that looks a little bit like this. So uh, um, AWS Lambda uses a trust policy to grab C uh, credentials from Secrets Manager, which returns a token, which it then uses on uh, RDS proxy to connect to the database pool. So PHP on AWS Lambda. One of the fundamental goals of the product team in, uh, in AWS is to make it easier for developers to build applications. Everything we do really is in service to that goal. And one way they're able to do this is to manage the runtimes for our customers and what they're building in. There's a number of custom runtimes already supported and it's most likely when you're watching this uh, presentation now that some of these are already out of date and that's the nature of a, uh, a natively supported runtime is that AWS is product team is constantly updating, patching, and um, adding new runtimes to uh, that are supported within Lambda. Now these represent the majority of what we see our customers building applications in AWS today. You'll notice that PHP is not on this list, and that's because um, it's not uh, it's not what we see the majority of our customers building on. But we as PHP developers know that it still runs about 80% of the web. And one thing AWS is very good at is listening to its customers. So if we if they see enough PHP uh, demand for Lambda, there's every chance that it will be supported in the future. But the good news is, is that until that time, it's actually very easy to build uh, Lambda functions using PHP. And you're able to do that, uh, not just for PHP, but for any Linux compatible runtime. And it's powered by something called the Runtime API, and it can be distributed as a Lambda layer. Now, if you want to build your own custom runtime API, you need to create this special file called a bootstrap. And the bootstrap acts as a kind of communication bridge between the function handler and the Lambda execution environment. And it uses this runtime API and some special environment variables to form this bridge. Its job is to help the Lambda execution environment understand how to run and execute your code and your language that you bring. So the bootstrap is responsible for a kind of um, invocation loop cycle that needs to do a few important things. So the first thing it needs to do is process inbound events and headers. It must also initialize the function and invoke it. 
and it needs to uh, handle the function response and include any errors that occur. And it also needs to manage the function cleanup as well. And as I said, there's some key environment variables that are available to your bootstrap file in order for you to do this. So there's a variable that holds the host and the port number of the runtime API. There's one that um, holds the name and location of the handler and another environment variable that holds the directory that your uh, function code is sitting in. And here is an example of a bootstrap file that works, um, a very simple bootstrap file that's doing all of those things that we just uh, looked at. So we can see it's processing the next request. It's using uh, this environment variable to communicate with the runtime API. It's handling, uh, it's using the handler function here with the environment variable. Um, um, that's how it knows which, what the name of the handler function is. And here it's returning the response back. So if you build your own custom runtimes like this, you're able to do some really interesting things. You can make very lightweight custom runtimes with only those versions of PHP and those modules and those package dependencies that you require in your application. So here's an example where I'm compiling the required version of PHP in an Amazon Linux environment. I'm using PHP 7.3. And then here you can see I'm including the extensions that I want to use in my application. So this is me using MySQLi. And then I'm packaging up the binary and the bootstrap file together into something called runtime.zip. And I'm using the CLI to publish that to a layer and then here I'm adding that layer to my Lambda function. And that's how this Lambda function knows that it's a custom runtime running PHP. I can do a similar thing to add libraries and dependencies. So I can install uh, Composer. And with Composer, I can install, uh, for example, here I'm adding the AWS CDK for PHP. I'm going to use that in my Lambda function. I then zip that up into something called vendor.zip. And I use the command line interface to publish that to a layer. And then here is a screenshot from the Lambda console where I have two layers in my Lambda function. The first is the custom runtime. And the second is the vendor layer that holds all of my libraries and dependencies. And now I'm able to separately manage my runtime and my uh, library um, dependencies um, separate from each other and just add those two layers to each one of my Lambda functions. And in this example of an actual Lambda function is where I'm putting all of that together. So first I use the use statements to import the SDK classes that I'm going to be using. And here I'm using PHP to um, use those SDK libraries to grab a token from RDS proxy. What I'm actually doing is this token uh, exchange that we looked at earlier, all in that three lines of code. And then here I use my SQLi to actually connect to my database. So the good news is, is if you don't want to create these very slim custom runtimes, very specific to your application, and you don't want to go away and compile your own versions of PHP, um, you don't have to do any of that because there already exists this um, fantastic open source production ready PHP custom runtime for Lambda and it's called Breath. And this has a very active uh, community that are updating and maintaining. Um, and it's really the go-to place for building PHP uh, Lambda functions. And you can deploy this layer by um, this custom runtime by grabbing the layer RN that you wish to use, the ARN. So here I'm using PHP 7.3, um, and I'm just simply adding that to my uh, Lambda function definition. And I can do this using the SAM framework or the serverless framework or the CDK or any other number of frameworks. So Breath's PHP FPM layer is actually really interesting and does some very clever things for you. This is one particular layer called PHP FPM, and this uses the Fast CGI Process Manager, which is traditionally used in servers like Nginx and Apache to manage inbound requests at really high loads. So Breath's own implementation of FPM takes care of a number of things for you. It makes sure to run each HTTP request in a new process, which is the foundation of PHP's shared nothing execution model. It also populates all the global variables that you're used to using, like get and post, and you can access them from within your Lambda function. And it provides a mechanism for PHP scripts to return HTTP responses back to the browser via Amazon API Gateway. So that's, that's an HTTP response as opposed to the default JSON response. And most PHP frameworks are built around these FPM features. 
which makes this a really good runtime to tra transition from server hosting to serverless hosting without changing too much about the way you build the actual application. So this is a high level uh, uh, architecture of what this clever breath layer is doing for you. So first API Gateway receives the HTTP request and invokes a Lambda function. The Lambda function environment then executes the bootstrap for the breath based runtime. And breath converts the HTTP request from the API Gateway format to the fast CGI format. Then the breath bootstrap calls PHP FPM through the fast CGI protocol and PHP FPM runs the PHP handler and returns its response. The breath bootstrap then converts the fast CGI response to API gateway format and breath is then able to return that response to API gateway, which returns an API response to the client. So all of this, what it's doing is enabling you your Lambda function, a single Lambda function to take a HTTP response um, run your code on it and then return an HTTP response and you don't have to change very much about the way you're building your actual PHP application and it's all thanks to the way that this uh, custom environment from breath handles uh, PHP FPM. So once again this is the serverless LAMP stack, LAMP stack Lambda, API Gateway, MySQL and PHP but I always think of it uh, as the direction that the request is going in. So your request will come in through API Gateway into Lambda, and then Lambda is running PHP, and MySQL is running on Amazon Aurora. It's all happening inside the AWS cloud, and this is the direction of the request. And we know that Amazon Aurora is uh, created inside of EPC. And what you can do, I always suggest this as the kind of first step for PHP developers moving into serverless, is to um, use Lambda as a scalable web server. So what this means is um, using a single Lambda function to hold your entire uh, code base and then using API Gateway to route all requests to that single Lambda function. So essentially you're using API Gateway as a catch-all. It's acting as the HTTP router. And the Lambda function handler is invoked every time a request comes in, which is kind of similar to the traditional index.php being this sort of first point of call in a traditional LAMP stack. So here's how it looks the, the serverless way versus a more traditional way. So on the right here, you have a Apache, uh, Apache 2 config file where you set the directory of your application. And then in that directory, you have an HT access file which tells it which um, which file to root or request to, index.php. On the left hand side, you have a, a similar kind of setup where you have API Gateway catching every request and sending that request onto a single Lambda function, and you're able to configure that with two simple API Gateway rules to just say any request needs to go directly to Lambda. And what this means is because of the uh, scalable nature of Lambda, you have a very scalable uh, PHP application where you don't have to manage any infrastructure. But one thing to be aware of is the Lambda pricing model. So Lambda charges per request and per duration at the given memory allocation. So this makes it ideal for handling requests for dynamic compute, but it's less efficient than at serving uh, static content. And that's where the CDK, like uh, sorry, the CDN, like CloudFront, is is ideal for you. So CloudFront is a large-scale global content delivery network, CDF, and this provides secure, scalable delivery of content, and it does this by caching data across points all over the globe. And this brings the content closer to the requester, with reducing latency and improving the overall user experience. So what you're able to do here is to set a rule in CloudFront that says anything for a certain uh, URL, like slash assets, route that directly to S3 for my static content, my CSS files, my JavaScript files, my images, etc. And anything else, route that via API Gateway to a single Lambda function for my dynamic compute. And you're able to use breath in this way to run the popular PHP frameworks that you're used to building in, like Laravel and Symfony. That's one way of building serverless applications with PHP. You can go further, though. You can build um, event-driven microservices with PHP as well. So in this implementation, we have a front-end application that uh, routes all requests to something like slash API to Amazon API Gateway. Amazon API Gateway then has its own uh, routing um, uh, rules, which, for example, if it uh, 
attaches something for slash map, it will route to this specific Lambda function. This will process the request. It might use RDS proxy to set something in Amazon Aurora. But what you're also able to do here is to have other rules. So if you have something to slash view, that might add something to a serverless event bus or Amazon event bridge. You might have another Lambda function which interacts with an SQS queue. You might have a different Lambda function which triggers a um, a step functions workflow and each one of these functions is uh, tightly scoped to perform a specific piece of business logic and what you're also able to do then is to very tightly scope the permissions around that lambda function kind of shrink wrapping the permissions to only be allowed to communicate with those services that that function needs to operate with um, the other th benefit that you get from this is that each individual lambda function is now scaling um, in line with the uh, with the requirement or the consumption that it needs rather than one big lambda function having to uh, service every single request you can have smaller lambda functions servicing individual requests for more specific um, compute and remember all of these services are serverless so they all scale automatically as needed to handle um, the the demand for requests so where do you get started Start with the framework is always my advice. And normally now I would recommend to start with SAM, the serverless application model from AWS, or with serverless framework, for example, a technology partner. But for this particular um, uh, instance, I would recommend to have a look at the CDK or the cloud development kit. Now, the CDK enables you to define cloud resources using a programming language like TypeScript or JavaScript or Python. I think it's also C Sharp and Java. Um, and the main power of the CDK is that it allows you to create reusable and shareable cloud abstractions that we call constructs. And these are higher level components that are really important for best practices. And you can use these together. You can blend constructs together to give you a really good jumping off point to further customize your application. Then when you deploy this uh, template, it gets transposed into cloud formation syntax and the resources get deployed onto the AWS cloud. And there already exists this fantastic serverless LAMP stack construct library. Um, and this is an open source abstraction that offers a single high level component for defining all the resources that make up this serverless LAMP stack that we've been talking about. So here you can see there's two constructs that exist here. There's one for a Laravel application that runs on a single Lambda function behind an API gateway URL that uh, routes all requests to that Lambda function. And there's another construct that lets you that you can connect this to, which creates a um, RDS proxy uh, pool and connects to a um, Aurora RDS database running MySQL. So here's an example of that template file in TypeScript, where at the top of the file here I'm importing the CDK core and then I import the construct library for the serverless LAMP stack, and then I um, create the constructor and I provide two important arguments to that constructor. Uh, the first one is the, the breadth layer version or the ARN, the resource of the version of breadth that I want to use. And the second one is the local path to my Laravel application. Then I use the CDK deploy command to deploy my application. This gives me an API gateway URL, which when I go to in my browser will serve up the kind of bootstrap implementation of Lambda. And of course I can configure that API gateway URL to be whatever domain I, I, I need it to be. And if I want to now go in and edit my application, the, uh, the file structure looks like this, where I have a CDK template here where I can edit my uh, resources. And here is the code base for that Laravel application. And I can um, code pretty much as I would do any other Laravel application. And that's nice and separate to where I've defined my cloud resources. So that's a really quick uh, rerun of this uh, entire presentation. And uh, what do you do next? So I would recommend, first of all, if you're interested in everything I've discussed, to Google the serverless LAMP stack, and that will take you to a six-part blog series on the Amazon, sorry, on the AWS Compute blog, where I jump into everything discussed here in a lot more detail. There also exists uh, a repository on AWS samples on GitHub, where you can uh, look at code samples and tutorials, again, 
going over everything I've discussed in more detail. And there also is a community curated resource page there as well, which has articles, case studies, talks and videos and tools from across the serverless PHP community from a number of different people. And there's a lot of great people to follow there on GitHub and on Twitter. And of course, I recommend you have a look at the open source PHP layer for Lambda, which is Breath. There's a lot of great documentation on that as well. So that's to recap, the traditional LAMP stack does not scale very well, but with serverless technologies, PHP developers can build scalable web applications without managing infrastructure. So imagine never having to do another uh, Apache restart or never having to SSH into a Linux machine ever again. You can build decoupled microservices for backend applications, or you can use the existing mature PHP frameworks that you're already using, like CodeIgniter, Symfony, or Laravel. And you can move from prototype to production really quickly because you know your application will scale straight away. And if you don't want to compile your own custom runtime, you can use an open source layer like Breath. So you can build serverless applications with PHP, and I'm really excited to see what people start building. Thank you so much for listening to this presentation again, and please do reach out to me on Twitter if you have any more questions, and I would be more than happy to discuss anything serverless PHP with you. Thanks very much.